Hi, everyone, and welcome to Home Growing the Life Show, where we talk all about growing food at home to live a little bit more of a sustainable lifestyle. Um, in today's episode, we're going to be talking all about natural pest solutions. Uh, what can we do to try and get more food from our garden and less of feeding all the pests? So if you are tuning in live, then make sure you jump into the live chat and say hello. Um, and let's get started on today's episode. So today I'm going to share a little bit of an update from the garden plant of the week, and then I'm going to dive into a few different things. One, we're going to talk about some main goals and strategies around pest management, and then we're going to look at some long-term sustainable solutions, because really that's the ultimate goal is to create some, you know, long-term solutions to manage pests naturally in the garden. Then we're also going to talk about some short-term solutions, because whilst we're waiting for some of these long-term things to get going, what can we do right now in the garden to reduce some of those pests that we're having trouble with? So from this episode, you're going to be able to have a few key takeaways in terms of what you can do right now and what you can start working on that over time is going to compound and create more of a balanced ecosystem so your gardens can thrive and be less vulnerable and susceptible to pests. That is all coming up in today's episode. But before we dive in, please, if you could do me a small favor, if you are watching or listening to this on whatever platform, please make sure you like and subscribe so that I can reach more people and help other people um, grow more food at home, be inspired to grow more food at home. Um, it's a small but mighty thing that is going to help um me and this channel grow. But that is enough from me in terms of an introduction. Let's get straight into some garden updates. What's happening in the garden? I actually don't know what's happening in the garden. Um, not a lot of gardening has been taking place in the last week. I have been popping a few radish seeds in here and there. I have been, um, I guess, topping up some of my natural pest management, some of the things that we're going to talk about in terms of um, short-term solutions. But it has been raining. It's been raining here and uh, we've got quite a few days of rain now. My garden has been absolutely loving that and it has meant that things have been a little bit slower on the front. But I've also kind of planted all of my gaps so I don't really have any room to be planting things although I will still try. Don't worry about that. I still... I'm always popping seeds in here and there, plants, you know, I can't stop. Um, so not a lot else. What else has been happening in the garden? Um, I am, I was filming a, well, I am filming a little bit of a garden update in terms of basically what's been happening over the last week. So that will be going live this weekend. That is a lot of feed jar harvesting. I'm still harvesting quite a lot of feed joas, although it has slowed down in the last few days because we got such stormy weather, a lot of them were blown off the tree. So I did a big harvest and so now there's less on the tree. So I'm just getting a few here and there, which is kind of nice. It's nice to have a little bit of slowdown on, on that front in terms of the feed joas. And I did remember I was taking some scraps out to the compost before this episode and I did walk past the seeds that we planted in episode one. And I remembered to bring them inside to show you guys because I did take those seeds uh, outside to get some sunlight, to get some rain, and then I kind of forgot about them. <laughs> so uh, I have got them behind me. Uh, I'll give, show you those. So these are seeds that we planted in episode one. They were just random seeds in this little indoor trough. So mainly we've got different types of lettuce. We've got some red lettuce, some green lettuce. There's some parsley just popping up now. I think there's also some pansies in there. There's a little kale plant as well, I think. I'm pretty sure that will be kale. 
So it is growing quite slowly, but it also was very much neglected. So that is what the indoor seeds look like that we planted in episode one. Um, but that will be really nice. I'll be able to have some greens available just to pick right here in the kitchen. So if you are wanting to start a little bit of an indoor garden, you can do it in a really small container. Just chuck some seeds in. And that is what is happening with that, this little seed thing. I think um, there's actually some seeds that are still popping up. So it's really interesting when you plant seeds and you think, surely they've all popped up by now. We're at, we're at episode 11. So this is 11 weeks in. You'd think that they would all be popped up by now. But no, there's still seeds popping up in there like all the time. So it just depends on the right you know, temperature, the right conditions to see how it all goes. Um, but let's jump into plant of the week. So plant of the week this week is thyme. And this one is good timing, I guess, because this is going to be one of our um, really beneficial plants in terms of pest management in the garden. So we are going to talk about some plants that can help us attract some more beneficial insects to the garden that are going to help us with natural pest management. And thyme is one of those. So the things that I love about thyme is that it has edible flowers. It is a pollinator plant. So it attracts a lot of insects to the garden, a lot of native bees, um, a lot of parasitic wasps and hoverflies and also lacewings will lay their eggs on the leaves of the thyme. So these are all things that we're going to dive into in this episode, uh, beneficial insects and how they can help play a role in balancing out our pests in the garden. Um, it's also a perennial, which I love. So it just continuously grows in my garden. It's hardy and it's easy to grow. It has... Um, lots of small fibrous roots, so it is really, really good for erosion prevention, which means it's great to be used on borders because it can sort of hold the gardens in, or if you have a sloping property, it can help um, hold that in and keep uh, all your soil together so it doesn't wash away. And it is a really low-lying edible plant, so it's a great edible ground cover. Uh, you can use it on the edges, on the... Um, the ground, I have it in my raised garden beds and it sort of kind of cascades over the edge. So if you do have like rockery areas and things like that, it works really well. Um, it also has a lot of medicinal qualities. So it's really good at boosting the immune system. It's got antiviral, antiseptic, antifungal and antibacterial properties. So it's a really good medicinal plant to have in the garden and it can help soothe some of our cold and flu symptoms, our sore throats, our coughs and things like that. So one of the ways that I like to use it is to pop it into tea blends and in winter I love making herbal tea blends. I There was something that we used to do a lot on my live videos back in the day is, is make a little bit of a tea blend so we might have to bring that back because now that it's getting cooler you know having a warm cup of tea with fresh herbs and flowers from the garden is one of my favorite things to do there's only so many cups of coffee I can drink in a day so it is good to mix it up with some herbal teas and um, thyme and thyme flowers are something that's going to be really beneficial for that uh, so that is plant of the week I hope that um, that shines the light on sort of like the you know, humble time. I feel like it gets forgotten about quite a lot, but it's also really good on like pizzas and tomato based things, pasta, slow cooked meals, roast veggies, all the things. So it is kind of a really good staple herb to have in the garden and it has so many, so many uses. I could go on forever about the time. So um, that is it for time today. We've run out of time for plant of the week, but um, let's talk what we're all here for, pest, natural pest solutions. And I'm going to start off with some long-term sustainable solutions, because that really is the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal for me is to have long-term sustainable gardens that continue to get more and more food over time with less effort on my behalf. And 
I've specifically called it natural pest solutions rather than natural pest control. And I think the word control in terms of the garden is something that is, you know, really widely used in conventional gardening in um a lot of our agriculture we're trying to control the situation we want to you know have things available now we don't want pests we want instant gratification and that is not a long-term solution it's something that is a band-aid solution that you're going to constantly have to keep fixing so we want to create some you know thriving edible gardens that work in harmony and that have a balanced ecosystem so how do we do that um and it's a bit of a numbers game. So when you first start out, you're not going to have thriving ecosystems. If you've just started out, you've got a brand new garden, you've basically got to start from scratch in terms of building that ecosystem up so that it is balanced. So to start with, it's going to be um, a little bit harder and you're going to have to work on that over time. So one of the things is, is like, you have to be patient. You have to have all these, you know, strategies in place that we're talking about today and be a little bit patient with it. And when you first start out and you have a small garden, you also have a small amount of plants. So everything is a lot more precious. Like if you only have 10 edible plants, you know, and those get eaten by bugs, of course, that is so devastating because that's like your whole garden, your whole crop. But over time, as you start to get more gardens and you start to work on some of these long-term sustainable strategies, then you're not going to worry so much if 10 of your plants happen to be eaten alive because you'll have a lot more. So it is something that is really hard to start with and really frustrating. I mean, it's still frustrating for me. I had some garden beds that I was getting a lot of pests in, a lot of slaters. Um, They were eating all my seedlings and it just made me not want to plant in there. I just, you know, it just, it, it felt hopeless I felt like if I was to plant anything they were just going to get eaten and especially if you're growing these things from seed like that's a lot of effort it's a lot of time um it can be really off-putting if all of your food or all, all of your plants are getting eaten by bugs um so I understand that so I'm going to also share some really quick things that you can start doing in the garden as well that will hopefully hopefully reduce some of that um you know off balance because that's what it really is to start with is like everything is sort of really out of ba- out of balance when you have these new gardens um so it is all about creating balance and we're definitely going to talk about ways to do that but one of the other things that's really important to do is to observe the first thing we want to do is react like when you see bugs in the garden you just want to fix that straight away like freak out oh my gosh they're eating all my seedlings I'm not going to have any food, but it is really important to take a step back and just observe for a little bit. And that way you can figure out, are these bugs like actually causing a lot of damage or are they just there and then they're not doing too much actual physical damage? Because sometimes I've noticed that as well. I don't know every bug in the garden, that's for sure. And I see bugs and I think, oh, are you what are you doing? Are you doing good things or are you doing bad things? How much damage are you going to do? So just observing it, having a look online, seeing if you can identify that bug, quite often they're actually beneficial or good bugs for the garden. So it's not rushing to try and fix the solution straight away, but just observing it, seeing if it's actually causing damage or causing the plant to not produce. Because some plants can be eaten and still produce fine um produce so observing is a really important part of it another important part is to actually have a pest population to start with so a lot of our beneficial insects or things that are going to help reduce the pests in our garden aren't going to come if there's no pests in the first place so actually having a population of pests in the garden is quite important to bring in the good bugs as well so that's something to consider as well is that you know if you don't have the pests to begin with you're not going to get the beneficial insects in 
to start reducing that population because if they are feeding off those pests and you don't have them in the garden they're not going to hang out in your garden so it is good to have a sort of balanced amount of pests obviously if those things are levels are getting too high and out of balance then we're going to have to jump in and try and fix that but to begin with if you are getting a few pests here and there don't stress about it because that's going to attract a lot more beneficial insects and critters to the garden to you know help naturally bring that balance down a bit but those things aren't going to come if the pests aren't there the next thing is edible flowers and you guys know I love edible flowers and there's so many amazing reasons to have edible flowers in the garden but one of the biggest things in terms of pest management is they attract a lot of beneficial insects. So we are going to talk about what types of beneficial insects and how can we, how we can attract them later on in this episode but to start with the main thing is a lot of them are going to come for edible flowers. And having a huge, wide, diverse range of edible flowers is going to bring in a huge, diverse range of beneficial insects. And, you know, having some native flowers as well. Native flowers often will attract native beneficial insects. And they are going to be, you know, really good at helping keep that balance and keep some of those pests down. Another one is letting things or letting vegetables go to seed. So if you've ever seen, you know, like a bok choy or a radish or rocket go to flower, my gosh, they have so many flowers. They're absolutely covered in flowers and usually covered in bees as well. And they attract a whole range of different beneficial insects to the garden. We've got hoverflies and um, parasitic wasps and predator wasps. All sorts of things come for the nectar and the pollen on the flowers and nothing really bursts to life like a vegetable going to seed and also then you get all of the seeds from that plant and some of them fall into the garden and then you don't actually have to replant them next year so that's always great as well as to have self-seeding plants in the garden um but uh having a lot of flowers in the garden is really really crucial And you don't have to plant them directly into the garden. I like to plant edible flowers in amongst everything, but you could have them in a pot beside your garden. That's going to work just as well. You can have them, you could have a native garden nearby your veggie patch. You can, um, there's so many different ways to incorporate flowers or native flowers, edible flowers into your garden without actually having to put them in your veggie patch. If you have a very small patch and you don't want to use up that room, um the next thing is plant diversely this is really going to help create some long-term sustainable solutions is to one it confuses the bugs so we're not creating buffets here if we have a huge row of lettuces or we have a huge row of bok choy and the bugs find it and they decide that that is like delicious you have just created a buffet for them and they can just go from one plant to the next to the next and demolish the whole row and so what I like to do is I like to plant things in different garden beds mixed into the garden so you know I could have bok choy planted next to my thyme and the bugs might not lock might not like the thyme but they like the bok choy but they have to get through the thyme to the bok choy And then if they want the other bok choy, they've got to go to the other garden bed. So I'm making it harder for them. I'm not just offering them up a platter of their favorite thing. And um, that's why I like to plant things really randomly throughout the garden. It also brings in a lot of beneficial insects because just like us, our beneficial insects don't love all of the same plant so having different plants in different areas is going to bring in different insects to those areas and the more that we can bring in the better so diversity in terms of plants flowers all the things is also going to bring in diversity of insects and beneficial wildlife the next thing that we can do if we're wanting to create long-term sustainable solutions for pests in the garden is to focus on growing soil. I can't stress this enough. 
Soil is really the key to a healthy and thriving garden because without really healthy soil, we're not going to grow healthy plants. So those plants are going to be more vulnerable, more susceptible to diseases and pests. They're not going to be able to withstand a infestation. So if you get a whole crop of caterpillars coming in and your plants are all weak and you don't get to them in time and you don't pick off those caterpillars or someone else doesn't pick off those caterpillars in time, your plants are going to really struggle. (coughs) Excuse me. So having healthy plants to begin with, I mean, we're only halfway through. (coughs) I can't lose my voice. That would be not ideal. All right. I think we're good. Um, the thing with lives is we can't hit pause on that. We have to keep going. The show must go on. All right. I don't think my voice is disappearing just yet. But it is so important to have healthy gardens. And the thing that's going to give us the healthy gardens is the healthy soil. So if we can focus a lot more on growing soil than growing plants, the plants will just grow. You won't have to worry so much about them. So grow healthy soil. And that's in terms of composting, worm farms, compost teas, adding mulch, adding always adding something back into the soil. So constantly adding layers back in, nutrients back in, um, and not constantly just taking, stripping it out in terms of the plants and the nutrients and not putting it back in. So keep putting nutrients back into your soil. That's going to help grow your soil. Uh, and that's going to give us healthy plants, which are going to withstand a lot more pests. Another one is having sacrificial crops. So there's a few different plants you can have that will sort of attract the bugs and then keep them off your other plants. But if you naturally just see one of your plants is getting absolutely eaten by bugs, quite often I'll just let that one get eaten and the bugs will all stay there and they won't move on to the other plants. If I remove that plant and I'm like, yuck that plant is covered in bugs remove it those bugs are going to go find someone else another plant to feast on so they'll end up spreading out through the garden so having a plant that you can sacrifice and just let the blood the bugs go to town can stop them from going um moving on to all your other plants i find like kale is one of my really good sacrificial plants i'll often get one kale plant that just gets attacked and I'll just leave it there, let them have that one while I, while I get to enjoy the rest of the garden. Um, and then another one is attract beneficial insects. And we've talked a lot about this um, in terms of adding flowers. But what beneficial insects do we want to attract and how do we do this? So some of the beneficial insects that we can have in the garden are ladybugs. Um, ladybugs are really, really good for the garden and, uh, can help with our aphid problems and all sorts of problems in the garden. The same with lace wings, parasitic wasps, predatory wasps, they will lay their larvae. I mean, it's kind of ruthless, but they'll lay their larvae in things like caterpillars and, um, they'll hatch out and feed on those things. So, Not all wasps are a worry. So if you do see wasps in your garden, they could be beneficial. They could be helping you out with your pest management. So it's another one that we don't instantly need to be like worried about. I think having a look, trying to research what, you know, what they look like. You can just Google like the different types of wasps that you've seen in your garden. But you don't always have to fix all of the bugs in your garden because a lot of them are actually going to be doing beneficial things and helping us out with our natural pest management. Uh, Praying mantises, spiders. I know like a lot of people aren't a fan of spiders, but they do have a lot of benefits in the garden in terms of helping with our pest management. Um, Hoverflies. These are another really, really beneficial one. They kind of look like bees. When I first saw them, I was like, are you a bee or are you a fly? And they're like a little bit of a cross between. But hoverflies are really, really good beneficial insects for pollinating. And then also a lot of these bugs, it's their larvae that are actually going to be eating a lot of the bugs and the aphids in the garden. So it's, it's not necessarily 
the bees that you see or the hoverflies that you see, but it could be their larvae or their babies that are feeding on our bugs that we don't want in the garden. Um, so having them there in the first place is, is ideal. And the way to attract, you know, our bees and our butterflies and our hoverflies is by having a lot of flowers, uh, that's going to bring them in. Then they're going to lay their eggs or their larvae. And those are what's going to eat a lot of our bugs in the garden. Dragonflies are another one. Uh, they are really beneficial to have in the garden. And then we also have, I mean, there's a whole huge range of beneficial wildlife to have in the garden, but geckos and lizards are great. Frogs as well. Birds. I've got like small birds that come for the nectar, but they also eat slugs and snails. So whilst they're feeding on the nectar from my flowers, they'll also do a little bit of a pest control in the garden. So um, attracting those little birds to the garden with nectar producing flowers can really help there's a you know we could go on like hedgehogs snakes all of those other things they do have some benefits to the garden um it just depends on do you want to attract those things to the garden also keeping that balance like if you had a whole lot of frogs in the garden that's going to work out the balance and we're going to have issues if we have a whole lot of birds in the garden that can work out the balance and we can have issues as well. So it's all about trying to keep this balance going. And nature does a really good job of that. I think nature does a much better job of that than us. But sometimes we do have to jump in. Um, so how do we attract these beneficial insects to the garden? So one is no sprays, no chemicals, no herbicides, none of that. Those are really going to damage the, our ecosystem. They're really going to stop any of those beneficial insects wanting to come to our garden so um, that's where we're obviously trying to go all natural so not using anything like that insect hotels those are really good and you can do some really cool DIY insect hotels that's where you can get some more of those parasitic wasps or bees a lot of our native bees a wide range of little insects lace wings and things like that uh, diversity, we talked about that, but you know, not all insects are going to want the same plants. So different types of plants also gives us different habitat. So some insects or wildlife, so for example, our dragonflies, they really like moist water boggy situations. Same with frogs, they're going to want water. So Having different areas of your garden there that are a little bit more water related or, you know, shady, damp, those are going to attract those sort of insects. Uh, having dense foliage, like little, those little birds, they, they don't want to be out in the open where hawks or crows or anything else can get them. So offering them lots of little places to hide by having diverse range of foliage and also a diverse range of flowers because those insects all like different things. Some of, some of them like nectar, some of them are coming for the pollen. Um, there's so many different things that they are all wanting. So if you have a wide diverse range, you're going to get hopefully more in. And I can kind I can just see it like in terms of my garden I have now started to have lots of different types of gardens I've got raised garden beds I've got fruit trees I've got a food forest style garden I've got container gardens and I can see so many more birds and insects and geckos and skinks and um, bees and it, like there's just so much wildlife that I'm seeing now and I look over and like my neighbors are renovating their property they have zero trees they've got no grass it's just complete sand whilst they build back in they're going to put more plants and trees and stuff back in but right now they have nothing they have just sand so there's not going to be a lot of wildlife going there there's going to be no insects and things hanging out over there so you can just really see if you build it they'll come and in terms of even if that's just in pots and containers they are still coming for the pots and containers so it's a it's so a little bit by little bit, you can start creating different style gardens, a little bit more diversity, different types of leaves, different types of flowers. 
it's like a building block that's just going to compound over time to attract more and more diversity in your garden and then you're going to have a wider range of insects to help you and these are they're going to help you with your natural pest management and you're not going to have to do much of the work yourself Another thing is plant density. So planting close together is going to give more of those habitats. It's going to offer more hiding places, more really safe places for the bugs to lay their eggs. Uh, It's also going to keep a lot more moisture in. So if you do get really, really hot weather or really wet weather, you've got more places for them to be protected from to keep warm, to keep dry. And things like that. So planting densely is also a really, really good way to attract more of those beneficial insects into the garden. And that is all well and good, right? We want to have long-term sustainable solutions in our garden. We want to have these things compound over time so that we can really create more of a balance. But that isn't something that happens straight away, especially when you're first start starting out. You've, you know, created a new garden bed. You don't have density. You don't have diversity. You don't have all the insects in your garden. What can you do? We need to sometimes step in. I try to do, I do try to do as little as possible in terms of, um, you know, dealing with pests in the garden, I do try and observe. But sometimes you have to step in and be like, okay, caterpillars, there's too many of you here. (laughs) This isn't going to work. Or there's too many snails. This isn't going to work. So what can we do? What short-term solutions can we do to really try and bring that balance back? Because that's really the idea is to bring that balance back and then we can let nature sort of do its thing. Um, but these are some of the quick solutions that I use in my garden. One of them is crushed eggshells. I'll crush some eggshells, pop them around my young seedlings. One of the things is to not crush them up too much, to have some more jagged, you know, bigger, sharp pieces. Because the idea of the crushed eggshells is that the slugs and the snails don't like sharp, um, surfaces to go over. So, If you do crush them up too small, it's just going to, it's not really going to make much of a difference. So having um, those jagged edges there. And even if this doesn't work for you, you're still adding nutrients back into the garden. You're adding calcium back into the garden. Calcium is really crucial in terms of our tomatoes and our nightshades because it can help reduce some of our blossom end rot. So you're never going to be um, causing any, any issues by adding those eggshells into your garden you're just going to be adding nutrients in but that can be one layer of protection another layer of protection could be that we use coffee grinds and I've been using these lately for my slater issues and also I've got these tiny tiny snails that look like they should be in a fish tank they're very very small Uh, they demolish seedlings as well and the coffee grinds seem to be helping keep those at bay so I've been sprinkling coffee grinds around my young seedlings it's really helped reduce their numbers. They've sort of, I don't know where they've gone, but they've kind of gone elsewhere. So that's great for me. Um, Physical barriers. So if you are just really struggling with it and you need to do something because it, it does get you down you do want to stop gardening. If you, you know, stop just feeding all the bugs, if you're not getting anything out of it, it's really hard to keep going. And we do want it to be sustainable long-term in terms of, we want to be able to keep doing it long-term. So we do have to sometimes do things like put nets on or put, um, cages around things. If you're getting rats, if you're, um, especially with pumpkins, if you are getting rats eating your pumpkins or your zucchinis or things like that, maybe we actually have to put a physical barrier around to stop them getting in and eating those things. And the same with like our fruit. So whether you, your fruit are getting absolutely demolished by parrots or birds or fruit fly, you may need to put those physical barriers in place just so that you can at least get something out of it. Otherwise, you're not going to want to do it. It's just going to be a waste because you're just going to give up if you're constantly getting zero from those fruit trees or from that food. So physical barriers can sometimes be a good way to just help with that. And I also use collars on my young seedlings. I think we talked about that a few times in terms of 
blocking the slaters out of my garden. They don't like to climb up those barriers. So um, is there something that you can physically put in, in front of that to stop the pests just for a while while you try and figure out the rest of it? Another one is manually remove. So sometimes we just may have an excess of caterpillars. We may have an excess of snails. Uh, and it's just, there's no way that this is going to be balanced out. So sometimes you do have to physically go out into the garden and remove those. And a couple of days of removing caterpillars and slugs and snails will make a huge difference. It'll help bring it down, help it become more manageable. Uh, and maybe some of those natural long-term solutions can come into play. So one of the really good ones to do is do it at night. So slugs and snails like dark, cool, damp times and nighttime is like the most popular. So if you go out with a torch at night, especially if it's been raining, you will see all of the slugs and snails and you might just need to collect them all into a bucket and just actually manually remove them just to help bring those levels down so it's more balanced, more manageable. Um, the next one is make it undesirable. So what do slugs and snails like? What do slaters like? Whatever is eating your pests, whatever pests are eating your vegetables or your plants, what do they like? Look up, look it up. So slugs and snails like damp, cool, dark, slimy, slippery, wet conditions. So is that, is there something you could do to your garden to make it less wet, slimy, dark? <laughs> Slippery. So it could be that you cut some of the grass around the edges so that it's, it lets in more light. It could be that you um, take out a few plants and leaves to let more light in. So, it, it, you know, the surface of the soil is not so shaded. You're not giving them all of these like slippery places to do to get to your plants. The same with like they like timber or uh, my raised garden beds are color bond metal and they, they're quite happily slithering over that. Um, so are there things that you can do to make it more undesirable? And the same with slaters. Slaters like dark, they, they don't like the sunlight. They, they like it when it's quite damp. So what I ha have often done is move my gardens cause I have some pallet planters on wheels. I've moved them into more sunlight. I've removed some of the mulch around so that around the plants so that the stem of the plant is getting direct sunlight and they don't like that. They're like, no, we want to hide. We feel vulnerable out in the sun in the open air. So what can you do to sort of mix it up and make it not a five star hotel for the pests and make it a one star hotel for the pests? Because that might um, make them go elsewhere or move on. Another one is for slugs and snails is like we spoke about, they like damp, moist conditions. So if you water the, your gardens at night, that is like the best. The slugs and the snails are going to love that because they're going to get, you know, 12 hours of this damp, moist, dark time to get out and go to town on your gardens. So watering them in the morning means that by the evening, most of your gardens will have dried out and that won't be as desirable for them to go to town overnight. So what can we do to really just, you know, make it a one star hotel for these pests? And that there's obviously so many more pests that, than the ones that we're talking about now. But um, what do they like? What is their prime location? What, you know, what do they love? Can we remove that from the garden? Can we put physical barriers in? Um, what can we do to just like reduce the numbers or make it not be a delicious buffet for them? Um, and by reducing some of these pests physically, we can, yeah, like I said, bring that, bring that back down so that we can bring in our beneficial insects, which is going to take time. A lot of these things are going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. But the thing with creating these gardens is that over time, you're going to get, you know, different types of gardens, different types of plants. I don't know if you're like me, but I'm constantly adding different projects to my garden. Like I've got my pond project coming up. Um, 
these different types of ecosystems are really going to attract different types of insects and that's going to help long term. So if you are really struggling with pests, don't give up, don't um, get disheartened. Just know that it is something that's going to improve over time if you keep going, if you keep and making these changes if you keep adding to your garden if you keep growing more plants if you keep growing more flowers um over time it's it is going to get better it's just when you first start out and you've got new gardens they are really vulnerable because the 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 balance isn't there the ecosystem isn't there the diversity isn't there so um I hope that helps. I hope that really gives you something that you can tangible that you can take away with you now to actually get started in the garden um, in terms of short term solutions, but also those longer term solutions. Those are the things that we want to ideally work towards because those are what's going to help us um, long term over time create sustainable gardens because that's, I think, well, for me, that's the whole goal. I want this to be a long-term thing and I want to be able to create different pockets in my garden and not worry so much about all the other ones that are going on. So if you do have any questions, make sure you jump into the live chat, pop a cue in front of them um, and we'll see what's going on in your garden. Um, there's lots of, I feel like there's lots of talk on mosquitoes as well and oh my gosh, there's so many comments in here. Thank you guys so much for showing up live. It is a uh, so good to see you turn up. Each and every week, uh, we have mosquitoes. Naturally prevent... <laughs> oh, um, is it Chimmy? Nat how to naturally prevent mosquitoes. Those little vampires are everywhere. Um, so dragonflies are one of the ones that are also really good for getting mosquitoes. Um, and... I think there's a few people in here that are suggesting other plants that you can grow, like the citronella plant. It That's a type of geranium, I'm pretty sure. I do have one of those. It does smell amazing and you can crush it up and use that to try and ward off some of your mozzies. Uh, if you do have ponds, then there are mosquito fish because mo mosquitoes like to lay their larva in water. So it could be that you have lots of water, bodies of water or um, ponds uh, do you have a lot of leaf litter as well they like to lay their larvae in the little pockets of leaves um, that are collecting rain uh, but again attracting some of these insects into your garden is going to help with the mosquitoes uh, the more insects we can get in there the better and yeah there's like a lot of people are saying in here um about paper wasps control cab cabbage moths in my garden. Yeah. So there are a lot of pests that have good and bad. So there can be some things in the garden, some pests in the garden that you think, like for me, slaters, my gosh, you guys you know that those things attack all of my seedlings, but slaters also have many benefits to the garden. So slaters are, uh, decomposers, they're helping break down organic matter and turn it into soil, which we want. We want to grow soil. They also help reduce some heavy metals in the soil. So there are huge benefits to having those in the garden. But it's just, I guess, a man a managing that balance and not having them overrun my garden and eat all of my seedlings or having them in areas of my garden, like you guys can go over there and go to town, but like not in my... <laughs> container gardens so it's things like that and the same with so many things in the garden like even snakes you guys I'm terrified of snakes snakes would probably make me sell my house and move back to New Zealand uh, where there's no snakes <laughs> uh, but snakes also play a really good role in the ecosystem snakes you know keep down mouse control they eat small mice and rats and things like that so they do play a really important role in the ecosystem um like many of the insects and things in our garden it's just a matter of um i guess balance and also please don't come to my garden snakes mm, I'm terrified i'm actually terrified i think i'm just mainly terrified because it's not something that i'm used to 
I didn't grow up in Australia. I grew up in New Zealand. And so snakes are a new thing for me and they terrify me. I just, the unpredictability of them, but they also do play a really vital role in the ecosystem. Um, Kristen, I have short-term success with my brassicas. I've planted sporadically and not in a row and not all are getting targeted. Yay, I'm so happy about this. Um, it's definitely something that's worked really, really well for me is not putting all of my eggs in one basket. And that can be for a whole range of different things. It could be that those garden beds don't have the right soil for those plants. But if you put them in different parts of your garden, they may really thrive. So you can observe that, you can see that and just see that, you know, the brassicas are loving life in my raised garden beds or they're loving life over my pellet planters, depending on where you put them. So um, having things planted in different areas, as long as you're keeping an eye on it and observing, you can really use that to your advantage and you can see what's working and what's not working. Um, what else have we got in here? So many, I've got like little, I've actually got my door open at the moment. There's like lots of little bugs coming into my uh, light. I'm just attracting them all inside. Uh, so they are attracted to light. So if you want to go out into the garden and start looking for bugs, a light will help you do that. Um, I looked online. I'm missing out on the chat, you guys. There's so much going on in here. The hoverfly. Yes. So I had never seen hoverfly until I grew mini chrysanthemums in the garden. So I have mini chrysanthemums, which are an edible flower. They look like a daisy and they... Oh my gosh, the hoverflies love them. And that's when I started to look into what a hoverfly is because I had never heard of them. I'd never seen them. And they are incredible pollinators, incredible beneficial insects to the garden. So um, I would never have known that if I hadn't planted those mini chrysanthemums. But I have seen them on lots of herbs. So that is one thing that is really great for attracting beneficial insects to the garden is a lot of our herbs. They seem to love those flowers. Our dill, fennel, um, what else? Yeah, dill and fennel, coriander, which I'm not a fan of, but if you like coriander, then let that go to flower because those are really, really good for bringing in our ladybugs um, and our hoverflies and all of those sort of things. So Herbs and letting vegetables go to seed. I find a lot of native bees also love my vegetables when they go to seed or go to flower. So that is another reason to, you know, just let a few of them go to flower and go to seed. But um, I think that is everything for today's episode. I hope you have got some great things to take away. I hope that if you aren't watching this live, that you join one of the lives because uh, there's a whole party going on in the live chat and I don't even know if I'm involved. <laughs> I love it. I love that you guys are all helping each other out and giving suggestions and um, it's so great to see. So if you can join the live, then definitely do so. But thank you guys for joining me. I will catch you next time, same time next week for another episode and happy gardening for the rest of the week. <laughs>